Good evening. Thank you for joining us on The Late Show. It's Monday again, and it is uh, the 22nd of January. And I do have again a wonderful guest uh, who's quite familiar with us, and you're familiar with him, and that's Pastor Derek Walker from Oxford Bible Church. Good evening, Thank you, Derek. Howard. Thank you. Are you fit? Ready to go? Well, I'm ready. Q&As, these questions that are going to come at you because you're the Bible expert. Uh, not trying to pump you up, but I'm just trying to let people know that this is an opportunity for you at home to be able to put your questions to Pastor Derek. So someone who's uh, really studied the Word of God and uh, is uh, fitting uh, for looking at uh, questions, particularly on uh, end times or eschatology, uh, but he knows the complete Word of God. And this is something which uh, these days, Derek, not many pastors in churches, particularly the traditional churches, you know, the Anglicans and maybe even the Catholics don't talk a lot about Jesus coming back again as he'd promised. Mm. So uh, why do you think that is? It is strange, isn't it? Because especially if we believe we're in the end times and the, the signs support that, that in this end time, we should be most aware that Jesus is coming soon. And really that should motivate our lives. But it, it seems to be neglected. I, I, I suspect that it's not taught in the seminaries. It's considered to be a subject that isn't relevant because it's something that's off in the future. And so uh, people just leave it alone. I've but, uh, often heard uh, in the past where people would say, like, the book of Revelation in itself is a book for fools. This is really? what some of the seminaries that right. I'd heard, uh, this was going back 30, 40 years ago. So um, I, I remember it was uh, one of the main uh, speakers on eschatology in the States. Uh, him and his wife, I can't remember, the two together, very, mm. very good. Uh, and they're exponents of understanding end times. Mm. But with all that we have as evidence today that the world is changing rapidly, um, not for the better, I may add, it seems that it's becoming more liberal and, and certainly more um, sort of doing away with the precepts of God, you know, and changing the laws to, I suppose, suit themselves and maybe this is why the church at large doesn't want to get into end times because it's it's going to be in a battleground they try to find what people want uh to hear and in it's calm and it's easy to deliver uh, but somebody has to sound the warning bell do they not that's right um i think you're right there's a lot of kind of motivational preaching which is kind of um or feel good or something uh a kind of practical common sense that will help people now. But in fact, the Bible teaching, a big part of it, is on hope that it's that vision of the future that God's Word gives us, called hope, that actually causes us, it gives us a vision for our life. It's something that goes beyond the immediate now. And, uh, and we need to get that, that Word deep in our heart so that we, we live according to the vision that God has for us. So a lot of the teaching is kind of short-sighted. It's kind of, yes, it's trying to help people now, but we need faith, hope, and love. We need that hope as well. And that's what teaching on prophecy gives us. Yes. Can I just say that um, I was just reading before we went on air, as I usually do, just to get some inspiration and see what the Lord wants me to share. And the scriptures that uh, came to mind uh, as I turn through the Bible there is the second book of Corinthians, chapter 4. And I'll just hold it there for a minute. But today, Simon Barrett interviewed uh, a Holocaust survivor, mm -hmm. obviously getting on in age, but she, she, all her marbles were there. Mm -hmm. It was amazing, really. L lovely lady. Um, CBE and uh, name, I, I forget her name, but lovely. I spent some time with her. But when we were talking after the program that she did with uh, Simon, she said it still, she can't grasp how mankind should, could be so cruel. And so, um, you know, what, what she went through, what she saw, her, her father killed, uh, her, her brothers, and she was without hope, as you say. Mm. She didn't understand what was happening. And as many Jews who suffered uh, at the time of the, of the Holocaust, uh, they are perplexed as to why such evil uh, acts were I suppose, perpetrated in the name of, uh, mm. through, well, the Nazis. And she said to me, why do you think the world is so evil? 
and she see, seen it deteriorate. Mm. And, and I shared with her, uh, from memory, the scripture that I'm about to read. Mm. And that's uh, 2 uh, Corinthians chapter 4. And it says that even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. And in case, uh, and in whose case, the God of this world, that's uh, Satan, mm. has blinded the minds of the unbelieving so that they, they might not see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is in the image of God. And I was trying to explain, as using other scriptures as well, uh, right, Revelation 12, you know, that mm. Satan has come down knowing he has a short period of time left mm. and he's going to uh, do as much damage as possible. And it seems that when we look at the world, and, and I, I don't think anybody could deny it. I mean, we've had, we have more callous acts of murder, stabbings, uh, uh, and horrendous evil that is actually uh, out there on the streets that, that wasn't there perhaps, maybe it was hidden. Well, I don't think so. I think it's just what's happening as we can see, as according to 2 Timothy chapter 3, that there is a, a cooling off of people's love for one another, mm. right? And that uh, all these things manifest in, in the spirit. They don't have the spirit of God, they have the spirit of this world. And the spirit of this world is uh, uh, let out through the God of this world, who is Satan. And I just wanted to share a couple of other scriptures here. It says, we are afflicted in every way. We're now talking about those as Christians who mm. are trying to share the, the gospel, which is veiled to those who are perishing, who don't, they reject it. The world at large rejects it. And even in the media, we're seeing more and more of this happening. Um, mm. And it says, we're afflicted in every way, but not crushed, perplexed, but not despairing, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed. For we who live are constantly being delivered over to death for Jesus' sake, so the life of Jesus may also be manifested in mortal flesh. And uh, one other one I just want to share with you is we walk by faith, not by sight. So mm. when we as Christians see these, uh, these days unfold and they are wicked and all sorts of things are happening where we can find ourselves um, being the bad guys, all of a sudden <laughs> the tables have turned over the last <laughs> 10, 20 years. What was once uh, considered evil or, um, you know, outside of God's laws, as now we're outside of God, mm. and not God's laws, we're outside the government's laws because we stand for biblical truth. Mm. So as we go through today, I just wanted to share with people uh, that we may bring a message of hope as well. As mm. we look through what seems might be a great time of trouble that we're heading for, and all the mm. things that Jesus spoke about are going to happen in, in a generation that we, we believe that we could be in that generation. There's every sign. Uh, that that's the case. So yes. live at revelationtv.com, uh, that's your email to put your questions and also the text number that's on your screen and Pastor Derek will answer them all. Great. <laughs> you know, I've set the scene there a little bit. Uh, you know, people are starting to think, why is man so evil? Why oh. is, uh, is there so much hatred out there? Well, first of all, you've got the fact that man is fallen. There's no such thing as uh, Explain a perfect... Explain fallen to a, yes. an, a new be yes. believer. Yes, um, that we are not as God intended. Uh, God intended us to be perfect, to be in the image of God. And I think this is the basic Christian morality, Judeo-Christian morality, is that each of us are in the image of God. And that means even we should even love our enemies. We should even respect uh, the people we disagree with because they're in the image of God, and that would cause us to treat them in a loving way. But society has increasingly rejected that idea, uh, and the more it rejects God in order to, to do it my way, the more it's easier to dehumanize other people, and that's, how that's opened the door to, to great evil. The fact that our society, it's got remnants of the Christian of that Christian idea that we're in the image of God. And that's why we still do, you know, look after the, the poor and the elderly to, to a degree at least. But the more that we reject God in our society, the more that concept has no basis. And that, that allows us to treat people badly. And so, yes, to go back to your question, uh, the Bible says that in the beginning, mankind rebelled against God. We were made 
to live under God's spirit, to live by God's life, to live by God's love, to not to be independent beings, but to bend, depend on the spirit of God, the presence of God. For but the we, good of many, for and the then, good of the many, isn't for, it, really? Yeah. If we live under God's laws, it, it's like yeah, if we were to do our own, uh, interpret our own laws for driving, we, we yeah. would cause mayhem, yeah. but we have to com comply. But it's deeper than that. It's not just mm. living by God's laws. It's living by God's power. It's, it's like that the, in the beginning, the first man, he chose to do it his way, to be his own God, to say, God, I don't need you. I will do it my way. I'll decide what is right. I will define myself. I will define my own life. And when he did that, he got cut off from his power source, from, from the source of love, to, from the source of life. And he became a fallen being, is the theological word for it. In other words, he received a, a sinful nature in himself. And now he's bent towards selfishness rather than because of the absence of God's love or God's presence in his life. Uh, so he loses his peace, he loses his joy, he loses that, that, that life force uh, that comes from the Spirit of God. And so that's the first problem. Um, and then the second problem, as you alluded to, that there is an evil kingdom, there's an evil person called Satan and his evil forces that then take a, reinforce that, if you like. Um, Wasn't and then, it there that the, the very beginning, sorry to interrupt, mm. but that, that Satan actually reared his head because he yeah. wasn't uh, an ungodly spirit at the beginning. No, he was created as a perfect angel. Yes. But he made that same decision to be, rather than to be under God, as it were, and submitted to God, to be his own God. Well, he questioned God, and he questioned God's right to rule over mankind and the way he was doing mm. it. And, and I was... Um, it might sound a bit strange, but I know peop some people would understand this. But I was very cross yesterday, and I was, you know, I said, Satan, you really messed up. I mean, you might think mm. you're doing a great job, but you, you, you and uh, in the beginning, maybe you thought you would just challenge God, as it says in Scripture. But you've actually not only challenged him, but you've done nothing good for mankind in the last 6,000 years since we believe that's when that happened. Mm. So uh, just at the time... Uh, when Satan challenged Job, a righteous man, you know, mm. and tried to destroy him. He's mm. been doing this to the whole of mankind, and according to Revelation 12, that's what his, uh, his end game is, is to bring down as many of mankind as he can because he knows his days are numbered. Yeah, there's a battle over every soul. Yeah. Are you going to choose to submit to God, or do you want to be your own God and throw off any restraints that God has for you. Um, to be, God made you to be a certain way. And we either embrace the truth that we're created by God and we're meant to live by God's presence, or we reject the truth and the Bible says we come under a lie that we are our own God, that we do it our way. And we come under darkness, um, the spirit of darkness when we do that. And so every human being in their lifetime has their life to make the choice to be God positive or God negative. Mm. And, Is it um, not a, a, a time where you could actually see that there's probably more of differentiation between <coughs> evil and good and those who yes. practice either? That's or. one thing that the Bible says at the end of the age, you know, Daniel the bright Trump. will become brighter and the darkness will become darker and the contrast will, will be great. Well, loads of questions are already coming in. So let's press on while we can. Um, <coughs> This is from Elizabeth. The Jewish year is 5776. How accurate is this uh, as our, to our year 2018 after Christ and 4,000 years previous more accurate? This is an interesting question, this, but it actually ties in. Either way you look at it, 5,776 years is it's nearer 6,000 years, which is what we can yes, but discern. It, it, it's inaccurate. Yes, but, I mean, but what I'm saying is the close yes. to a sixth millennium because mm. we know in the seventh millennium mm. there's the thousand year reign of Christ. Yes. That's what I'm saying, in, even yeah. if you're a few years out. So w what is the accurate Yes, if that were this? true, then we'd be over 200 years away. Yeah. But actually it is inaccurate. Um, the, and, and the Jews really know that. Um, the because of the way their calendar works. They're so works. bound to their traditions. Mm. This was based on the Seder Olam, which was in about the second century 
that, that was written. And so um, it is known to be inaccurate. Um, the problem is they took out about 200 years of Persian history and they, they lost, made some other mistakes as well. Uh, Who's the interesting, they? well, it's an interesting story because you know Daniel 70 weeks. Mm -hmm. When you know the starting date, and, and the, it's well established now, the, the Persian emperors like Artaxerxes, he made a d d decree that was the starting date for Daniel 70 weeks. Um, I believe it's 458 BC, that, it's that one. And then that takes you, after 490 years, or 77s, you see, that takes you to Christ, AD 33. And so it clearly proves that Jesus Christ is the Messiah. But the Jews knew that problem and that the Christians were using that as evidence for Christ. And they actually took a, over a, about 150 at least years out of the Persian history. So their dates for the Persian kings are wrong, but they brought them forward by, say, 200 years. Now, why would they do that? They did it so that you know, they, there was the Bar Kokhba revolt. You know, Jesus warned against false messiahs rising up. Well, there was a, a false messiah called Bar, Bar Kokhba in about 132 AD, and he created a, a big revolt in the time of Hadrian, um, which again le led to great destruction in the end. And the rabbi Akiva, one of the famous Jewish rabbis, actually pronounced that um, Bar Kokhba was the messiah. And uh, the disciple of Akiva was the man who wrote the Seder Olam. And he adjusted the starting dates so that it would look more like well, that Christ was not the Messiah, Jesus wasn't the Messiah, but this Bar Kokhba was the Messiah. And so they, there was a reason for the fiddling of the dates. But the bottom line is the Jewish dates there are actually wrong by two or three hundred years. But even so, Derek, what I'm getting at is it you know, oh, it's near 6,000. It's yeah. near the 6,000 uh, yeah. years. But actually, it's is... a lot nearer 6,000 than uh, so how, on uh, God's counting. So would you were saying it's, if you added, what, 200 years to that, you're looking at 5, 9, 7, 6? Yeah, I mean, roughly. Yeah, which is near yeah. to the, the, the 6,000 Everyone calculates 6, it slightly years. different. But yeah. I believe we're, we're, we're within just a few years of the 6,000. Yeah. Which is great, because that's good news. That helps us to hang in there with some hope. Yeah. I, I want to say this, that I've said it before, but just for new viewers, um, the, uh, sir, the, oh, now it's gone out of my head, um, the guy with the, the apple and the gravity and all that. Newton. Newton, Isaac <laughs> Newton. I always have a problem with Isaac, so remembering his name. Sir Isaac Newton, he, when he did his calculations, mm. He came up with mid 21st century for the return mm. of the Messiah. Mm. That is interesting. Okay. I just thought I'd throw that one in for good. Okay, thank you, Elizabeth, for getting us going. Everyone who falls uh, on the cornerstone will be broken to pieces, but when it falls on anyone, uh, it will crush him. What is this meaning? Uh, thank you so much. No name. It's going I to pulverize them, isn't it? This is, there, is, is this um, Zachariah? This is talking about. There's one in Isaiah. I think it's talking about the two comings of Christ because um, it says that this, the, the Messiah will be a stumbling stone for those who, those who are going their own way. You see, that stone is there that we put our trust in him. He's a rock that we should trust in. But others who are just going the way of man, which is to trust in ourselves for salvation. And, and particularly the, the Jews, the Pharisees of Jesus' time, they were into their works, into keeping the law, and, the, and that's how they're going to be saved. And so they, when they come across Jesus, they stumbled over him and they fell. Rather than receiving him, you see, they, they, they tripped on him and they fell. And I think the stone that comes from above, it's like in Daniel's vision, the stone that comes from above comes down and it, as it were, crushes uh, the, its enemies. And that's a picture of the second coming of Christ when he comes to judge the earth. And so once people have had a chance to repent, but they've refused, Jesus one day is going to return and he's going to set up his kingdom on earth. So mm. it's, I think it refers to the two comings of Christ. Right. But, uh, but of course, the other thing is that it says that, you know, people get offended at the, at 
the scriptures. And so, like, when Christ was here, he offended many mm. because of his, what he represented. It's not because he was out there, like, declaring uh, in an arrogant, belligerent way, but it was just, even with his mild manner and his wisdom, he still, what he stood for was, uh, you know, It's when you tell people righteousness. You're, they're wrong, Yes. they often don't like it. Yeah. And uh, the, when the spirit comes in the world, it says he will convict the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. And to convict really is to say, you're wrong, mm. you're wrong. But it's good news conviction. It's right, you're wrong. You're heading on a path that leads to destruction. And, but if you will turn this way, it will lead to life. So it's a correction, but it's to help you. Yeah, Jesus some people works. just get offended because they can't accept the fact they might be wrong. Mm. Uh, this is from Gordon. Where or what system does the false prophet come out of? Not quite sure. Well, I think myself that the false prophet, it says that the beast comes out of the sea, which I believe refers to the Gentile nations. But the false prophet comes from the earth, and I think that means from the land, from the land of Israel. So I think the false prophet will be Jewish. But is we this can't, tied up with the Antichrist? Sure. Yeah, well, he's the... Um, You've got the satanic trinity is the counterfeit trinity, you might say, because opposing fa the father, the invisible God, Satan is the invisible spirit that's playing at trying to be God. Then his, uh, the son of God or Jesus Christ, the counterpart is the antichrist or the beast. And then the, f the Holy Spirit, he is glorifying the Son to cause people to worship the Son of God. And in the same way, the false prophet, when you read about him in Revelation 13, he does great signs and miracles, and the, his whole purpose is to cause people to worship the Antichrist. And so he's, he's like the third part of the Satan's tr trinity, if you like, and, and he causes people, he's like a religious figure, that causes people to worship the Antichrist and to take the mark of the beast as, as, their, as an act of worship to the Antichrist. Um, my question is, when do those who are alive and born during the thousand year reign of Christ uh, on the earth receive their uh, eternity? How does their judgment work? Um, there's some other side questions as yes, well. If, if they're born From during the millennium, mm -hmm. they're, they're sinners. They're born sinners mm -hmm. like, like we are now. And so they need to hear the gospel and be saved. And so the gospel will be preached in the millennium. They'll have every uh, encouragement, obviously every proof to believe. And, and so they, they, if they receive Christ, I believe most of them will, but if they receive Christ, they'll be born again like us. And they will probably live to the end of the millennium because lifespans are lengthened, the curse is removed from the earth, and then they'll receive a rapture at the end of the millennium. Um, those who reject Christ um, during that time, even if they outwardly conform because he'll rule with a rod of iron, but they reject him in their heart. When Satan's released at the end of the millennium, he kind of gathers together all the rebels. Exactly. And there's that yes. final battle and then fire comes from heaven and then they will die. But then they'll be resurrected almost immediately to stand before the great white throne where all the, the unbelieving of all ages will stand before the great white throne before going into the lake of fire. Uh, Revelation 20, is that? Revelation 20. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Nick asks as well, what about the resurrection bodies? Uh, or do they stay in their natural bodies? No, no, I, everyone will enter the eternal state because it says this present heaven and earth, which includes our natural bodies, um, will be destroyed, you see. So they, they won't continue into eternity in their natural bodies. They'll receive a rapture at the end of the... Uh, if they're if alive. And then after Revelation 20 is tw Revelation 21 and 22, which is the eternal state. And we'll all be in our glorified bodies then. It will be a new heaven, a new earth, completely new. Okay. Um, uh, John from Ireland says, I think most don't know their eyes are veiled. Uh, Christians get this information from the spirit in Jesus, he says. I just, okay, it's... Uh, we were talking about that earlier on. Is there by warning in the Bible about the coming of Muhammad, asks Sue. 
Not a specific one, although Jesus did warn that false prophets would arise, and, as well as false messiahs. And so, um, as far as I know, there isn't like a specific warning of that nature, but you know, think, a general warning. Yeah, some people would uh, say, well, why would you call Muhammad a false prophet? Yes, well, uh, if somebody claims to be a prophet, which he did, then you have to judge whether he's true or false according to whether one of the tests that's given in, the, in Deuteronomy is that he has to speak in the name of Yahweh. And he, he never does. He speaks in the name of, of Allah, but never the name of Yahweh. Secondly, what he reveals has to be consistent with what God revealed beforehand. And the revelation given to, to Muhammad um, denies a lot of what has previously been revealed about the nature of God, about the, who Christ is and the work of Christ. And so, because it contradicts the word of God that came before, we have to judge it by that criteria. Very good. I think, um, you know, the fact that God has no son is written inside the, the temple yes, is, a, a, is a denial of scripture and yes, divinity. It's a denial of, of the heart of Christianity. Yeah, yes. absolutely. Okay, so let's go. Next one. Good evening. Can you please tell me the name of the man that Howard interviewed last Wednesday, <laughs> week or two? I don't know. It was the year 2000. Oh, my goodness. God bless you. Uh, the in the year 2000, that might have been Barry Smith. Okay, don't know. I'm, you'll have to give me a bit more information. Hi, Howard and Derek. In Corinthians, 1 Corinthians, it says a uh, man should have short hair, women long hair. Every time I see an image of Jesus in the Bible or in the church window or biblical film, he has long hair. My aunt was a nun. She had her hair cropped. How is that it was all right for Jesus to have long hair and not the ordinary man uh, from Dave? in Charbury. A good question that, Dave. What would you say? That's interesting. I think that um, the one question is how long is long? Mm. And I think the, uh, clearly the meaning of that scripture is that a man should not wear hair like a woman. You know, a man, exactly. there shouldn't be a confusion between the sexes. Is that Leviticus? Um, probably. I think it's in Leviticus, that, that it's law. A, it's a principle. Yeah. 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 That, um, the other thing is that um, the only reason why, you know, because I'm personally partial to the possibility that the Turin Shroud is, uh, is true. And, uh, but it, the one thing that bothered me, really, is that the man with the Turin Shroud had quite longish hair. And, um, but yet I'm reminded that if you take a Nazarite vow, one of the that's things is exactly. that you don't cut your hair. And yeah, there's intimations like in one of the Messianic Psalms that Jesus had taken, was, was, may not have cut his hair for a few weeks leading up to his death because mm. of a Nazarite vow. Absolutely, that's a uh, good which one. Which is interesting. But yeah. I do think there is a principle that we should observe. Men should not wear hair like, mm. like a woman. I think hair. in those days, I think probably if the hair was more to this length, it wasn't down the back. Um, there was a distinction. Yes, but it's definitely hard to know that each culture will have a different changes, definition. Yeah. Yeah, not but like definitely, our culture. you know, I always just say like this, men should look like men and women should look like yeah. women. And that's what the scripture says. Yeah. It is an abomination for someone yeah. to, uh, who's a male to look like a woman and a woman to, uh, to look like a man. Um, that's the scripture. Okay, not to cause offence to anybody on purpose, but that's the scripture. So, um, but Jesus, yes, more, more than likely uh, would have had the same sort of vow. Uh, and now, when you say Nazarite vow, well, let's make it... that was a temporary it... vow. Yeah. They, although Samson was a full-time Nazarite, yes. you might say. But uh, normal, more normally, people would take a, a Nazarite vow for a season, you know, not yeah. to drink right. and not to cut your yeah. hair. Yeah. And then after you've done your 40 days or however long it is, then you go back to the temple and... Yeah. You, in the 40 finished. days he was in the wilderness, his hair would have grown, that's for sure. Yeah, so there may have been reasons. But yeah. uh, generally speaking, I don't think... And, of course, just because paintings depict him that way doesn't mean he was that way. Yeah. Um, and so he, he probably didn't have very long hair because of that reason. Okay. Uh, have you read the Essene Gospel of Peace? Uh, these timeless words of Jesus continue to sow their seeds of peace and love in a troubled world, says Kath. No, yeah. I haven't. 
and the scenes were those that uh, John the Baptist were uh, living with it, uh, just around yes, the Yes, he wasn't scene. an Essene himself, yeah. but he may well have lived with, among yeah. them for a time, that's true. Around the Qumran caves. Quite possibly, yeah. yes. I've noticed a couple of shows hosted by Howard in the last couple of months. I don't know what I'm going to read here. You just you never know what sort of trouble you're going to get in. E.g. Ian McCormick and Derek Walker, where the distinct possibility of the time of 666 marking is portrayed as distinctly possible in the next few decades. In which case, current affairs like NHS, teaching people to have multi-income streams, stewardship, and all the term teachings, etc., seem to conflict with the urgency of getting the gospel out there i.e. the season for the end is really here and, and how should we prioritise? A nice Christmas or remove disclaimers and start to just say it all out louder. I would like to know what Howard and Derek thinks. Uh, we cannot know the day or the hour but the season. So, so maybe um, that changes things. But really, uh, recent shows hosted by Howard suggest very soon. Um, Luz, uh, this is from Les, I think it is. Leslie Fisher. Yes, Lots I mean, in there, yes. I believe <coughs> that me. it's we're in our lifetime. Mm. And so that should sharpen our focus. I mean, it's always been true. Jesus gave standing orders to the church to preach the gospel and to disciple new believers. And that should be our priority anyway. But um, sometimes we lose that focus and we get involved in other things. And he's, they're, they're quite right there. But... Um, Knowing that Jesus is coming soon, it should have that effect of focusing our, our, our purpose, our vision. And this is one thing about understanding the end times. It should focus us not to get sidetracked, but to focus on what's really important. And we can each do that according to our own gift. You know, we should all be seeking ways in which we can reach out to others with the gospel. And that should be our priority. So I absolutely agree with that. OK, we've got loads, so I've got to try and get through them in the next, whatever, 20 minutes we've got left. Um, I've heard it taught of late that Jesus was born again after he died and went to Hades. Uh, I find this hard to accept from Scripture. I would value your comments as being born again is very important when sharing the gospel. Um, this is from Leslie Watts. Lots of Leslie's tonight. This is a bit controversial. Yeah. But um, the I think... Um, the Bible doesn't exactly use that language, but it does say Jesus is the first begotten from the dead, which is, does, is that word born. I mean, something that I, I believe is that when Jesus died on the cross, it wasn't just his body that died, it was his humanity that died. So he, 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 God doesn't die, he was fully God and fully man. In his deity, he didn't die because he said, I will raise myself from the dead after three days. How, but his humanity, in his humanity, he tasted death for every man. So he's, he tasted our spiritual death as well as our physical death. And that means that when he was resurrected, his whole humanity was resurrected from the dead. It, and that says we were made alive with Christ. It's talking about our spirit. So presumably his spirit was made alive and by the same power of God, our spirit was made alive when we're born again. So I don't personally say Jesus was born again from the dead because the people might misunderstand that. But I do believe in his resurrection, his whole humanity, as it were, became a new creation. And he's the prototype for us. And so the same power that raised Jesus from the dead raised, raises us from the dead when we're born again and then when we're physically resurrected. Uh, this is from Dave the Bike. Um, I'm a Christian, but don't recognize the picture you paint of the woe-mocracy, woe is me type thing, human rights greater than ever, uh, the weak, the disabled, um, etc., were worse 50 years ago and much worse a century ago. Aren't you uh, guy rid today? I don't know quite, uh, misspelling or something. The world is getting better, surely. Uh, less war, more detected uh, than ever before. Equality for women and minorities. The world is suffering from a large dose of confirmation bias. Every blessing, uh, Mike. J can I just say that when you talk to the seven million people who are displaced, living, uh, their homes are totally destroyed. The three million Syrians or people from the, that part of the world mm. that have no home or hope. There are the people that are in many parts of the world have n greater famine than they've ever had. We might see certain 
smaller items uh, that like what he was saying you know uh, mm. women's rights and all of that yeah. uh, being improved over 50 years there are, it's not all bad but yeah. uh, i don't think he can really say <laughs> that things yeah, oh everything's better because yeah. that surely isn't the case yeah okay but anyway thanks mike i'm glad you're living in a co cocoon well i think you are hi to both of you i find it hard to see some people uh in the image of God, like for instance, that couple in California who held their 13 children prisoners. So terrible, I can't get my head around that. Um, thank you, lovely, it's a good show. Yes, we're, to complete that picture, we're in the image of God, but that image has been smashed, it's been broken. And that's what the fall is, that when man sinned, uh, that image got smashed. So that oh, there is still goodness in people, obviously, but we are much reduced from what we were in the past and yet even those people are redeemable that's the point the god still loves them jesus died for them and if they would turn to him he could uh you know transform them and make make them good again you might say so yeah can you look up chapter 24 of exodus for me in verse 9 this uh michael's uh, posing a question here um, and I'll read it. It says, uh, to ask Derek, if I may, about Exodus chapter 24, verse 9, where it said that 70 people plus Aaron and Moses uh, went up to the mountain and saw God and ate and drank. It's hard for me to understand. Uh, did they literally see the Lord? Because we know what the Bible says about no one can see God and live. Well, there's an, an, a number of um, times in the Old Testament where they saw the Lord, or the, or the angel of the Lord, mm. and these are called appearances of Christ, theo theophanies. Um, and the answer to that is, of course, that um, no one has seen the Father, but the Son Who has made him manifest. Right. And so these are actually appearances of the pre-incarnate Christ, uh, he, who took on a visible form, uh, often the angel of the Lord, who is... Mm often then referred to as God himself. So the visible appearances of Christ, of, God, of Christ in the Old Testament are actually God. No one could see the, the Father, that's true. It had to be Christ who they saw. But there are many examples in the Old Testament where they saw God. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> this is from Paul who says, uh, have you ever thought of the question, why didn't God just kill Satan after he fell and saving multitudes and multitudes of pain, suffering, torment, and deception? A good question. Yes, um, that goes very deep, and I can only just make a quick contribution Stretch. to that. Um, there's an, almost an inevitability. When God created the, a universe, whether it's angels or men, with free will, um, the issue must come up of, are you going to choose to submit to your creator or rebel against your creator. With free will. And Satan did that. And, and what God's purpose in this time, in this universe, which is just a very short time compared to eternity, which will be forever and ever, is to bring that issue to the surface and deal with it once and for all. And so although it's a terrible thing, sin is a terrible thing and it's the rejection of God. And so even a nice person deep in his heart can be a, a real sinner in that he's rejected God. And that's, that's the worst sin of all. Mm. And to deny even that your creator exists, that is actually deep darkness. Mm. And so God actually, in a sense, allows Satan to continue because he wants each person to make that decision in this life. And they make their decision then for eternity. Once that issue is settled then, we move into eternity where there is no sin, there is no evil. So, in a sense, God allows that for a, for a time because it's, it's necessary. Because he's not interested in making a universe of robots where people don't exactly. have any real yeah. decisions. Yeah. Or, and so, it's tough, but it is a kind of essential step toward having the final... Yeah, if I may put it to Paul uh, uh, in a way that I've seen, looked at this, and that is that uh, God... Uh, is uh, challenged by one of his angels, right? One of those that he's created, mm. and says, is it so, is it right, are you, the way that you're dealing with mankind? What about if you let him do this or do that? Mm. Now, the questions that 
I suppose, were really put were much deeper than that. And there was like, Satan was challenging the right for God to rule over man, almost, mm, right? Yeah. And so, yeah, God could have said, right, wipe him out. There are the other myriads of angels that are listening in. And mm. so what does God do? I mean, he could have wiped them out and then they would have gone, oh, maybe Satan, this guy. He wasn't called Satan then. Mm. He had an incredible position in, in the heavenlies. So it was like, uh, okay, God said in, in his wisdom for me, yeah. Okay, you go and do your own thing, all right? And let's see, at the end of the day, if those who, with their own free will, want to follow me, mm. and those who want to follow and you. And God vindicates yeah. his righteousness. Right, yeah. exactly. So, but it, as you said, it's only six days in God's sight. I know it, it's 6,000 years for us, but it is, it's gonna it's change. A, it's, it's a blink compared to yeah. eternity. But good question, nevertheless. The year in Jewish history is 5778, not 5776. We're only talking two years difference there, as the previous viewer had said. But thanks, Christine. Uh, let's press on. We've got about another 14 minutes. Right or wrong, the actual year of the Jewish calendar is 5778, William. They're all agreeing <laughs> on something here. OK. Um, hi, could you please ask Derek, uh, what would he say about the teaching that the King James Version of the Bible is the only Bible is correct and all the other versions are flawed? I have a friend who believes uh, this and is refusing to go to any church that does not preach this Needless to say, he's almost finding it impossible to find one. Uh, is he right or wrong? Thank you. God bless you. Uh, Gwen. Yes. Well, I, it's one thing to respect the King James Version, of course. It's uh, uh, wonderful. But um, a lot of its language is out of date now. I use the New King James. But um, nevertheless, to say one translation, as, as, to revere it as if it is the, the real word of God, Clearly, that's wrong. But there are the so many discrepancies manuscripts between in the, the two. In the, you know, we should, we should, you, you know, no translation is perfect. And mm -hmm. Some translations have advantages over others in different ways. Sometimes I like to use the Young's literal. Sometimes I, you know, it all de depends. So no English translation can be perfect. If you, the closest to perfect is to get back to the Greek and the original Hebrew. But no, I can't agree with revering one translation uh, to that extent. As if it's equivalent to yeah. the Word of God. Right? Yeah. Okay. Um, good evening to you both. I can recommend uh, your book, um, A Panorama of Prophecy, Derek. It's meaty and I'm taking my Thank time you. reading it. Uh, it's really helping me to understand the prophecies, says That's my big Judith. book on prophecy. Right. People can get it from our website, which okay. is uh, oxfordbiblechurch.co.uk. Uh, many devout Christians baptized in the Holy Spirit know that we are now at the very end of time. The abomination of desolation is the spirit of the Antichrist sitting at the very heart of today's apostate church. So so-called Christians are supporting the synagogue of Satan in the modern Israel and their fake Messiah. Beware. Um, no name. Uh, what mode of transport will <laughs> Jesus Christ use to get here when he returns? He said he descends on the Mount of Olives from where he ascended. It's, a, it's an ascension or a descension. So if we're talking about the second coming, yeah. it talks about him coming on a, on a horse, doesn't it? Oh, of course, yes, yes. Yeah. And, and then once he horse. has destroyed the armies of the Antichrist, then he will stand, presumably yeah. he'll get off his off the horse. horse and he'll stand on the Mount of Olives. That's his yeah. triumphal uh, ascent on the Mount of Olives. But there is a scripture, he says, I will ascend, the, uh, the way I go is the way I return. So, but even yes. so, the, the, no, the white yes, horse exactly. is very but clear. Yes, yeah. he comes on the horse. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Please, could you pray for me as I get very frightened at the thought of the end times. I can't get it. I can't get into church as I suffer from chronic pain. Thank you, Amanda. In Jesus' name, mm. Amanda, uh, we pray that you uh, will not have that fear because it says in scripture that he gives us not a spirit of fear or intimidation of a sound mind and you can get a sound mind by reading the word of God for yourself Amanda and uh, be encouraged because as Derek said right at the beginning of the show you know what Jesus came really with is an incredible hope I, w I would not be um, have this sort of uh, demeanor that I have of, of, of a very positive outlook even though it sounds very negative when we talk about things that are yet to happen but Christ said that we will be more than conquerors uh, when 
uh, we come through. And Jesus said in Luke 21 that when you see these things in the world begin to happen, look up for your Lift redemption up looks like. Jesus is coming for us as the bridegroom for his bride. And, uh, you know, we, it's, it's a blessed hope because we're yeah. going to see Jesus. Yeah. Uh, Jane asks, uh, please tell me, what does it mean to plead the blood of Jesus? It's a term used a lot yes. in Pentecostal church. Plead yes. the blood of I, Jesus. I'm happy with that myself. Yeah. Um, all it seems, it's really based on Revelation 12, 11, and originally on the Passover lamb that they would use hyssop and they would apply the blood to the doorposts. So it's not enough to believe the blood, you have to apply it. And it says that over Revelation 12, 11, they overcame the devil with the blood of, of the witnesses. lamb and with the word of their testimony. Yeah. So they declared with their mouth see. Yes. their faith in the blood. And that's really what pleading the blood means. Wow. So it says the blood of Jesus, you know, mm. covers my mind, covers my body. What, what I am doing, I'm declaring it with my mouth, my faith that the blood of Jesus has purchased peace for my mind, has purchased healing for my body, cleansing for my sins and so on. So it, it's, it's just a, a phrase, it's not in the Bible, but it means to apply the blood by speaking you know, we believe in our heart and we confess with our mouth. Mm. Very good. I like that. Okay. And the next one. Oh, uh, when Jesus sets up his kingdom in Israel, can, uh, can I, who lives in the UK, go to visit Jesus in Israel? Oh, bless him. Well, if you, we will be ruling and reigning with Christ. And yes, we will. It says when we're raptured, we'll be forever be with him. So we will have access to Jesus. But it says all the nations will come up yes, to we, worship Yes, that's me. the people in their natural bodies yeah. will be, you know, in the on earth. And once a year at the Feast of Tabernacles, at least representatives or, mm. or will, will go up and worship uh, at the Feast of Tabernacles. But we'll be in our resurrection bodies already. So we'll be ruling and reigning with Christ. And yes, because we're in our resurrection bodies, we will um, certainly have access to Jesus, yes. And he'll be reigning on earth, yes. Uh, Revelation chapter 13, verse 8. Just have a quick yeah, ready at that one. Uh, this yes. one's coming up. See that from Tony. Uh, I recently heard that John Piper uses uh, Revelation 13, 8 to put forward a Calvinist idea that God chose specifically who was to be saved before he made the world. How can we explain this verse from the view of Believing God wants us all to come to him and not just an elect. Thanks, Tony. Yes, it, it talks about um, those who will worship the beast whose names have not been written in the book of life belonging to the lamb that was slain from the foundation of the world. Yes, right. I mean, you. All, with all of these things, you, you, it's a big question because you're talking about sovereignty and free will. But the point is God knows. So God... You know, if the names of those who are in the book of life was known to God from before the foundation of the world, that's all it's saying. It doesn't say that God made, made them choose that. Yeah. But God's knowledge, God's omniscience m means he knows. Who, and, and, and that's all it means. It doesn't mean he sovereignly foreordained that certain people would be saved and that others wouldn't be. Otherwise, there's no point in preaching the word of God. But of course, God knows God. everything. Yeah. yeah. But I mean, for instance, I, I might watch a drama or, or watch a scene, and I, although I see it, and though I know it, um, doesn't mean I control what happens in that scene. So God knew everything in advance, yes, but that doesn't mean he doesn't give us free will. Yeah. I think the, the, the marking in the book of life is going to take place all the way up to the very end of this world system, isn't it? You know, so there's a, a yeah. chance uh, that we can definitely get in there if we haven't had... Yes, from our, from our point of view, decisions are being made in time. Exactly. But from God's point of view, he does know, and that, that verse does talk about the fact that, that God knew from eternity who, who would receive him. Hi, my name is Emmanuel, and I'm a Christian trying to understand the scriptures. Uh, but a question I'd like to ask is, if Buddha is mentioned in the Bible, and is he in any way linked to God? 
No, I mean, he's not personally mentioned in the Bible. Um, Buddhism is something, it's just a humanistic philosophy, you might say, of trying to control your, trying to control your flesh. Um, but they, it doesn't accept a personal God. And really, the aim of Buddhism is to kind of annihilate yourself, <laughs> in a sense, into, into nirvana. But um, so it's got nothing to do with, with the truth, although it, it might teach some helpful disciplines, you might say. I would encourage you, um, Emmanuel, to actually uh, start to consider really the scriptures that are talking about putting our trust in God and not in mm. any other man. And uh, there is only one name under heaven by which men may be saved, and that's not Buddha, and it's not mm. Muhammad. It is Jesus Christ of Nazareth, mm. and that's very clear. Okay, uh, Derek, what exactly is heaven? Maybe we've got 10 minutes to do it. <laughs> Three and heaven. a half. <laughs> heaven, well. Good heavens. The Bible talks about the heaven is a place for it's a start. It's the third heaven. It's the third heaven. Um, it's, yeah, it's a place where God's presence is far stronger than what it is here on earth, of course. Um, God's presence is and his glory is completely uh, manifested in heaven. There is no sin in heaven. When we die, our spirits leave our body if we're believers in Christ, and we go straight to be with the Lord in heaven. And the greatest thing about heaven is we're in the direct radiance of the presence of God. And so it's fullness of joy. It's fullness of peace. It's fullness of love. Uh, it's, it's, it's abundance of life. Um, that we can't even imagine how amazing and how exciting uh, heaven is. Mm. I definitely read Revelation 21, it's my favorite scripture, mm. um, because it talks about a new heaven and a new earth that God is uh, introducing um, where righteousness would dwell, and the, no more death, no more pain, no more sorrow. All those things would be uh, done away with. So it's gonna be a wonderful time and it's uh, still to come. So look out for that. Um, Cynthia, uh, have we got time to read another one, Mr. Mr. Director? Two minutes. Uh, okay. A documentary on television last week showed a man who had no arms and they had uh, placed a chip in his shoulder. I always say some people have a chip in their shoulder, but anyway, the chip had uh, all his details in it and a couple, he could open doors and do everything he wanted to do, even though he had no arms. Mm. Then they raved about how wonderful if everyone could have a chip. Um, as it would save uh, so much uh, inconvenience and money. Do you think this is the start of the mark of the beast? And do you think uh, we will be raptured before this happens? Oh, Cynthia. Well, it is happening already, as you say, people are taking these trips, which shows the technology is, is coming into place. And you can see, in a sense, everything's preparing the way for that. But no, it's not the mark of the beast. Um, obviously yet but um, so if somebody took the chip it doesn't mean they're lost forever or anything like that but it does show how close we are getting to to society you know using something like that as a chip when the when it is the mark of the beast is you will have to swear your allegiance and your worship to this totalitarian dictator who claims to be your god and um, and then you're given the mark and then you'll be able to participate in society. And so all the pressure will be on you to do that. And only if you have faith in, in the Lord Jesus will you have the courage not, not to take that mark. Mm. But uh, we'll be raptured before then, I believe. Right. Well, we're, we're <laughs> at the end of the program, uh, Pastor Derek, thank you so much for being with us today. But I just want to finish with this one from Jeff from Leeds. He said, should we be warning people of the coming tri tribulation? Of course, because Jesus <coughs> spoke about the great tribulation that sh uh, has never occurred before until that particular day it happened, mm. and nor will it occur again. So we haven't passed that date, uh, mm. and it's still for the future. Uh, and it does say, pray that it doesn't happen in wintertime, when you think of the harsh winters that you could have. But the most important thing is that although uh, many will be lost, uh, this is an opportunity now to make a decision to serve the living God. Thank you so much. Pastor Derek uh, Walker, Pleasure. and you look at you on uh, Tuesdays and Wednesdays. No, Wednesdays yes, yes, and Tuesdays, sorry. But, Tuesday yeah. at 10, Wednesdays at 8.30. Right. Thank you. Good night. God bless. Don't worry. Lift your head up. Your deliverance is near.